Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Cavens and this is 48 minutes of podcast with inspiring leaders. I'm very excited because today I spoke to Jerry Colono, who is my all-time role model. He's a US-based executive coach and he's also known as the CEO Whisperer. Jerry and I talked about why it's about time that leaders start growing up, about the illusion of always being busy and about the different patterns he observed in his career as an executive coach. It's a really interesting episode, so I hope you enjoy it. Okay, in this episode, I talked to one of my personal role models. His name is Jerry Colonna. Jerry is a world-class executive coach and is often referred to as the CEO Whisperer. He coaches many Silicon Valley startup CEOs and coached, amongst others, Brad Feld from the Foundry Group, Chad Dickerson from Etsy, and Alexander Jung from SoundCloud. People would describe Jerry as the best in the world, a life savior, or, and that's my personal favorite, a Trojan horse of the best kind. Jerry is the co-founder of Reboot, a coaching company that helps individual leaders, teams, and organizations to realize their full human potential. Prior to his work as a coach, Jerry was a venture capitalist focused on investing in early stage tech startups. He founded, amongst others, uh, Flatiron Partners with his partner Fred Wilson, which became one of the most successful early stage investment programs. His last stop before he became a coach was at GP Morgan Partners, the private equity arm of GP Morgan Chase. Jerry is a highly requested speaker on leadership topics and published his first book in 2019. It's called Reboot Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. Jerry is a Buddhist and lives with his partner, a 17 year old cat and three horses in Colorado. As said, Jerry, and his company have been a role model for me almost from the start. And I always hoped that I could have this conversation with him one day. So I'm very, very excited and grateful to have uh, that he accepted my request and to be uh, with him today in this conversation. Welcome, Jerry. Oh, thank you for having me on and what a lovely introduction and I'll, I'll make one updated information. Ginger the cat is now 18. So uh, yes, when we first emailed, she was 17, but her birthday was just a few weeks ago. So she is now 18. Happy birthday, Ginger. Yes. Happy birthday, Ginger. Jerry. And she'll yell at me as she does every day oh. looking for food. <laughs> Uh, Jerry, first question. I was actually, I always ask uh, guests that I think are inspiring and I always think like, uh, I, I will have a no, I can get a yes. And so that's the way I approached you. Uh, but uh, to be honest, you've been on the Tim Ferriss show twice. So I felt quite astonished that you said yes. So why did you say yes to the interview? I'm very curious. Why did I say yes? Um, I like talking to people. Um, and uh, I think that the topics that you wanted to talk about in the, in, the, in the first note you sent me, which I believe was on LinkedIn, and then we had an email exchange. It just felt like a promising conversation, something that I would enjoy. Um, you know, in, in a sense, imagine someone comes up to you and wants to talk to you about the thing you're the most, you're most passionate about in the entire world. And so it just feels the most natural thing in the world. As long as I can make the time work, you know, it's, it's, it's as if someone came up to me and said, I'd like to talk to you about your children. Okay. Let's talk about my children. Okay. <laughs> so that's what it was. Okay, super. I was just curious. Um, 
you're currently in what you call your annual two month sabbatical. Uh, yeah. I actually wonder, um, is this sabbatical different after the past one and a half years? Um, how are you experiencing it? Oh, it's absolutely different. Um, in fact, I skipped last year's sabbatical because of the pandemic, because of what was going on in the world. Um, it felt that uh, my clients just needed me in a deeper, deeper way. Um, and so I went into this time period, and you're right, I'm, I'm really right at the middle of this annual sabbatical that I do, and I've been doing for about 10 years. <laughs> Excuse me. I went into it tired. Mm. I went into it uh, exhausted, uh, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And uh, what comes to mind is uh, um, immediately is a brilliant, beautiful poem by John O'Donoghue, uh, which is from a collection of his uh, blessings called To Bless the Space Between Us. And this one is called For One Who Is Exhausted. And uh, there's a line in there that often comes to me. It was coming to me in May, June, as I was entering this period. And he says, uh, and now your soul has come to take you back. Yeah. And now your soul has come to take you back. You have entered slow time. Feel the way the rhythm of the rain falls. Feel the way the rhythm of the rain falls. Um, I needed that um, to be of service uh, to my clients, to my friends, to my mentees, to my colleagues. I needed to enter soul slow time. I needed to allow my soul to be taken back. Um, and so I've spent most of these last few weeks working on a new book, reading. Uh, I've read more books in the last few weeks than I have in the last year. Watching some wonderful television, um, enjoying sunsets and sunrises, eating well, exercising well, uh, hanging out with Allie, my partner, uh, her three horses, spring. Uh, Prince and Mr. Mariki, and feeding Ginger. Beautiful. Who needs to be fed twice a day? So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, Jerry, actually, it actually ties nicely with another question I had is that you take this sabbatical, you are slowing down. I think, and we might go back to that later uh, in the talk, but um, you weren't always uh, slowing down in your life. Uh, you've had very, have had a very fast paced life uh, before this as a venture capitalist. Um, I always, I often meet uh, clients who say, uh, they're always busy and, and then when you talk about them, about slowing down, it, it kind of makes them even more nervous, the slowing down. Yeah. And they come with, and, and you can say what you think about it, but they come with, uh, with things as, yeah, but I actually like it. I like the fast pace. I like, I like how it goes like this. What, what would you be saying? Uh, when, when people say these things, is it okay to well, try the fast lane or what's, what's your. I'm really glad you added that last question um, because what you, what you're identifying is a very complex and complicated structure. Um, uh, one of the mistakes that a lot of folks who seek to help other folks do is we try to insist, if you will, almost through shaming, mm. that people slow down. And, um, and what we run into when we do that is uh, 
a set of complex defense structures that um, manifest in the increased anxiety that you notice when a client is actually considering slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to name and speak to the, 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 the defense structures. One of the defense structures that we developed as children is to believe that our worth as a human being is dependent upon the output that we create. Mm. And I'll say that again. One of the defense structures that we create as children is to believe that our worth depends upon external affirmation, either through the grades that we get, the bank account that we carry, the status that we achieve, it's all other generated. Mm. And the system reinforces that over and over again. And the most extreme version of that is uh, how busy we can get. And so what happens is we take meaning from motion. Mm. We take meaning from motion. We, 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 <clears throat> put ourselves into a situation where our sense of safety, our sense of love, our sense of belonging is derived from how busy we feel. Mm -hmm. And then something happens, right? And they'll, they'll end up calling one of us, right? And they'll say, but I don't understand why I'm miserable. And it's a mistake to then say to that person, well, let's remove the structures that you have used for your entire life to make yourself feel better about yourself. Because we're going to shame you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the client will go along with that because they feel so terrible. Mm -hmm. But you're actually not inducing true transformation. No. Because until you can put into place some other mechanism where they can feel love, safety, and belonging. If you remove the scaffolding that busyness, that motion creates, then you're leaving them bereft of feeling love, safety, and belonging. And so, this is why I use term, a term like sabbatical, and I don't say I'm taking a two month vacation. And this is what sabbatical actually means to me, by the way. You know, as we started talking, I, I said to you, I was just working this morning. But I don't understand. I thought you were on sabbatical. And what sabbatical is about, it, to me, it relates to even that notion of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. We don't stop being human on the Sabbath. Yeah. Right? Uh, what we're doing is, uh, is entering a a different relationship with work when we go into sabbatical. Yeah. Now, in the middle of my sabbatical, I will take vacation, right? Meaning I won't work. But uh, what I'm doing is, is I remain busy, but with a different relationship to the work such that uh, I am not subjected to others anxiety mm -hmm. or to the anxiety that comes from grasping for external affirmation so that was a long-winded response to a very complicated question mm -hmm. but i appreciate being given the the, the chance to to speak to it fully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what you say is um it doesn't really make sense to try to convince them to slow down until they kind of, sorry, I'm changing my leg, and mm -hmm. until they um, have something to, to get rid of the fear of being worthless. It, it, it's, um, yes, I mean, and, and, and this, 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 is, this is a truism for all transformation, right? What do, what do we see? You know, we were speaking before the recording and you were talking about your commitment to bringing consciousness into the world. Um, you know, I like to use the, the, the phrase that I got from my partner, Khaled. We try to smuggle in consciousness, 
right? Um, and so what does that mean? What, what it means is that if we go at the, the, the things that ail people um, uh, directly, defense mechanisms are going to kick in. Mm -hmm. All right, and so um, what we have to do is we have to understand what transformation really means. Transformation, the, the, the first step in understanding behaviors that need to be transformed is to understand the benefits that those behaviors create. See, we're, we get so fixated on the negative attributes of those behaviors. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost out of a desperate attempt, right? Because what, what happens? You get a client who's at midlife and they've spent 20 years moving faster than the speed of light, climbing up a corporate ladder, trying to assuage an inner demon that says, you're a piece of shit unless you produce something meaningful. And then the system starts to collapse and they're in tears, either explicitly or implicitly. And the last thing that will work is to then hound them and shame them and say to them, you've done it all wrong. Because mm -hmm. trust me, they already hear that in their head. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is elevate that which they have done right and begin to make it clear that they have choices about how they want to be. Mm -hmm. Because the habit that got kicked in place when they were five, six, seven, eight years old feels like it's not a choice. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking in theoretical terms, as you know from having read my book, I'm speaking from my own experience. I know that treadmill. Mm -hmm. I know that relentless pursuit. Of, you know, in my book, I talk about the lemon drops that uh, my grandfather loved, which became symbolic of his financial security. And so it became uh, a useful metaphor for my own pursuit of financial security to the point where I was physically and emotionally exhausted and would drop mm -hmm. and collapse. And so I had to change the relationship with security in order to change the behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that, Jerry, what would make you a good coach? The fact that you have done the work yourself? Oh, well, the, the, <laughs> You, you have this wonderful habit of asking very simple but very complicated questions. Uh, so I'll try to be less long-winded. It's hard. Um, I, I'll speak just for myself personally. I have a hard time trusting teachers who haven't done their work. I have a hard time Uh, imagining a coach or a therapist who ventures to go into this realm who hasn't done their work. And I don't mean completed their work. I mean done their work. You know, so I'll be real simplistic about my answer. One of the first questions that I get asked by folks who ask about coaching is they'll say, well, how do you find a good coach? Right? I'm sure you've gotten this question yourself. And one of the first things I, I suggest to people is to ask them if, they, if the coach that they're speaking to has seen a coach or is working with a therapist. Mm -hmm. Because if you are not committed to your own work mm -hmm. as a coach, you are in danger of doing harm. And one of the precepts that I think we have to take in as coaches is to borrow from the medical profession, which is first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And so be wary of writers, authors, teachers, elders, coaches, who are too afraid to look in the mirror. Mm. And who start from a 
theoretical uh, what they've learned in the books. Yeah, it uh, and we can we can feel it. I mean, you know, I, I, I wrote a little bit about this in the introduction to my book. Um, God bless the people who write wonderful books that teach you how to do things. Here are the five things that you must do. Mm. I cannot read those books and I cannot write those books. Because for me, uh, it's all about modeling. It's all about showing, not telling. And uh, the, I don't trust someone who's going to tell me. I, I, you know, I'm a pain in the ass. When I was a kid, if a teacher would just sort of sit there and tell me what the facts were without telling me how they derived those facts, I didn't trust it. Mm. And, then, you know, in the years following my midlife, when I walked away from the venture business, I spent a lot of time listening to a lot of teachers. And some of them said wonderful things, but they removed themselves from the process. And I think that that's a kind of bullshit. Yeah. Excuse my constant cursing, but, you know, I'm from Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, we have a really, really finely tuned BS detector. <laughs> and I think that that's BS. Mm -hmm. No worries. In, in Europe, we, uh, we curse. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, especially in Italy. <laughs> well, especially in Italy. No, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. What are you going to say? Um, I wanted to know, Jerry, because when I was reading your book, and also mm. I feel uh, a lot of heaviness. Like, it, mm. it feels very heavy. Like, especially the start and... and, and I almost like sometimes I had to put it aside uh, to yeah, ch chapter one in my book is really hard to get through, <laughs> which, by the way, is a lousy way to write a book <laughs> to make the hardest chapter the first chapter. But please yeah. continue. <laughs> and uh, I was actually interested. Um, does it did it also feel like that the start of your life until you Yeah, you went through this huge depression until at some point even suicidal. Did it feel like all the way heavy? And, and was there a moment that you can remember where you felt the lightness coming in? Or, or how, how? You mean as a child? Or, or, yeah. Or, or, yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, and uh, don't worry, this next book is a little bit lighter. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, I'll circle back to your question, but I first have to tell a quick little story. So uh, I worked very, very closely with a woman whom I think is the world's most brilliant editor, Hollis Heimbach. Uh, she's over at HarperCollins, and she gave me the contract, and I'm working with her now in the second book. And I remember handing in a first draft of that first chapter, chapter one, which is a very intense chapter. And uh, it was written at the time in the first person, in the present tense. And uh, it's, it's actually now written uh, in the past tense and from third person perspective, this, you know, it sort of moves back and forth. And she said, when she wrote, she said, Jerry, you have to let people know that you're alive. <laughs> I'm halfway through this chapter, and I think you're dead. <laughs> um, so, um, but 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 I think you you touch upon something really important, which 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 is true about my work generally. Uh, you know, I, I have a reputation, and there was a there was an article written about me a few years back called the title of which was "This Man Makes Founders Cry." Mm. And I subsequently joked a lot about that title because it is, I do, but it's actually more specific. And this is, this is the point I'll get to. It's not about making people cry. It's about making people feel. Mm. 
And one of the challenges, the heaviness that you speak to, uh, one of the things I, I said before that I don't like bullshit, I also don't like what one of my teachers referred to as spiritual bypassing. Mm. Spiritual bypassing, which is I'm going to meditate on the light and ignore the dark. Mm. And the problem with meditating on the light and ignoring the dark is that the dark gets darker. Mm -hmm. The heaviness gets heavier. And so what I wanted to model was putting your, my head up to the mouth of the worst demons imaginable. First. Because if you think about it for a moment, intellectually, of course I survived. I'm here. I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> right um uh but it is hard it is hard and 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 um i i guess i'm a i'm a first responder in this way um you know firefighters run towards the fire mm -hmm. ambulance drivers run towards the building collapse you know, police officers go towards the person with a gun. Um, our impulse is to run away from those things. Mm -hmm. And when those of us achieve power by way of our white privilege or by way of our, the, the dominance of gender in a patriarchal society, when those of us who have power run away from the heavy, we create more heaviness. We make it more difficult for other people. Mm -hmm. And that's not why we were put on the planet. So. I, I really relate to that when, um, I think it's, it's some point in your book where, where you actually boil down to that where you say it's it's really not good for society even when people in power mm -hmm. don't know their operating model or don't know where it comes from and that's that's exactly what what actually drive me to start what, doing what i do now because i had a huge frustration on on many of those mm -hmm. people um so actually what you say, I, I like the, 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 the title of your book, Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. So actually what you say is that we usually, we, many people, they stop growing up at some age and then they think they're grown up adults. And so... Yeah, and, and you know, I'll often say, you know, why do we stop growing up? We stop growing up because growing up is hard. <laughs> Because it means that you have to confront things. And, and, you know, if you think about it, we're called into the fire of the work that we do because there's an there's a implicit wish for transformation at some level, either organizational or at the individual level, or usually both. Mm -hmm. Right? As I often say to a client, you know, when they first reach out, um, uh, they said, how do you know something's wrong? I said, because nobody reaches out to a coach because everything's great. Right? You, you reach out because you need to transform something. You need to change something. Right? The opportunity, wait, wait, and, and to go back to the point, if, 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 if people who hold power are unwilling to look at the structures that desperately call for change, then they unwittingly maintain those, those structures or worse, make them even worse. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that art of growing up. It's, it's, it's the ability and willingness to face what you don't want to face. Yeah. Which, and, and we don't want to face it because it's heavy or it's because it's painful. What's frustrating is that usually it takes 
the leader to start struggling before they start uh, yeah. changing trajectory. Uh, that's yeah. like one of my frustrations is that I see so many people that from a distance I can see, oh my God, you should grow up. <laughs> and you yeah. cannot help them until they look for help. I that that's right you know uh, um i for a number of years i was rafting you know whitewater rafting and there's an old line which is that when you're knocked in, out of the boat and you're floating in the water which is not where you're supposed to be when you're rafting and they move the boat over to get you to safety you have to participate in your own rescue you can't just lie back and flop around you actually have to climb into the boat mm -hmm. And, and that's an important lesson for people that we're talking about who, who are seeking some sort of transformation. You have to participate in your own rescue. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and you have to do it in a way and using tools that you may not have used before mm -hmm. or may not have done before. It's one of the few things you cannot outsource. One of the very few things you cannot outsource, amen. Fortunately. No. Unfortunately. Um, Jerry, something else. So in your paths to, uh, yeah, in your path of life, uh, along the way, you, you happen to become a Buddhist. <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what does Buddhism bring to you? Uh, well, you know, you're familiar with my term radical self-inquiry. And it's, it's not only all over the book, it's all over everything that we do at, at the company. So what does that mean? It means uh, the, the ability to, with skill and compassion, strip away the mask that we wear so that there's no place left to hide. The first place I really began to do that was in therapy. But the part, that augmented that and supported that the part of my life that augmented and supported that was meditation mm. it was on the cushion and uh what buddhism means to me um i'll tell you another funny story i remember working with a particular teacher he was from the east he was really frustrated with me And he, was, and he was so frustrated with the questions that I was asking and, and quite frankly, the spiritual bypassing that I was going through. And he grabbed me by the ears and he pulled his face into my face and he screamed at me, what is the nature of the mind? And I was like, whoa, this is really scary. But what he was trying to do was cut through the layers and layers and layers of protection that I had built up, like every other human being. And so for me, Buddhism is not about, uh, you know, I was, I was raised a Catholic. It's not about replacing, karma is not a replacement for sin, mm -hmm. right? Nirvana is not the replacement for heaven in these structures. Um, what Buddhism is about for me is it's a philosophical approach that says no bullshit. No more spinning, no more pretending, no more delusion, no more hiding. We're going to face what needs to be faced so that it can be changed. Mm -hmm. So that suffering can be alleviated. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the second noble truth of Buddhism is that the that which we do to avoid suffering increases suffering yeah. right so we try to avoid the heavy and it becomes heavier we try to avoid the pain and it becomes more painful mm -hmm. and so for me this is the first philosophic philosophy that said what is the nature of the mind mm -hmm. no bullshit what are we really up to here The fact that some perceive it as a religion, God bless, that's okay. I'm much more interested in the philosophy. 
I, I like uh, particularly in Buddhism everything which is related to why you suffer, just what you say. It's about it. It's about alleviation of suffering. Mine, yours, and by the way, if I work to alleviate your suffering, I magically work to alleviate my suffering. Mm -hmm. But conversely, if I alleviate my suffering, I'm working towards alleviating your suffering. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That's just inter yeah, that's interdependence. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, because in the end, it's not about finding happiness. It's just about taking away the things that make you unhappy. At least that's how I look at it. That's right, because our na nature is to be happy. Yeah. We're born happy. Uh, the, I, I remember one time when a friend of mine was were discussing Buddhism, which meant arguing. And she said, okay, okay, fine. So if everybody sat around and meditated and everybody felt better, then what would happen? And I paused and I said, did you just ask that question? If everybody sat around and felt better, what do you think will happen? <laughs> right? What will happen is we won't be going to war mm -hmm. that we will see that that we can work together to solve poverty mm -hmm. that we don't have to hurt the planet because we don't know how to resolve suffering within ourselves mm -hmm. that's all absolutely. isn't that a worthwhile goal absolutely that's what also relates to what we discussed about before uh, before we started actually about of all the problems in the world, there's like an overarching uh, lever, so to speak, that if we can work on that lever, for me, I call it consciousness or whatever you want to call it. For me, that's the overarching lever uh, to solve the big problems in the world. So, You, you, you would be really interested in the work of uh, the Buddhist teacher, Joanna Macy, M-A-C-Y. Uh, she's 90, um, but her work falls under a structure she calls the work that reconnects. And uh, she's an ecologist um, and, and uh, links our internal suffering with the suffering that we project onto the world, right? Um, you know, the world is a fire right now in part because our internal mechanisms don't know what to do with suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, it's funny you say that. I, I, I told the same to my friends last year and now again. The world was on fire, first in the Amazon, now in other parts. And then it was almost as COVID got injected. Mm -hmm. Slow down the fire All right and i'm afraid that if we don't learn from it more will come but that, that's maybe another discussion well i i'll just say i i share the same fear yeah. Yeah. okay um jerry in your book one of the you already mentioned it uh Radical self-inquiry, for you, the core of becoming a good leader is to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. more, far more important than to know, to get to know the skills, how to hire, how to fire, these type of things. Mm -hmm. I would say 99% of the books are on leadership are, are very on the how and not very much on the why. Why is it so important we, we know ourselves um, before we even start to think about running companies? Well, let's go back to something that we were saying before about the externalization of self-worth. Mm. Okay. One of the mistakes that I think a lot of leadership discussions makes and one of the, the reasons why I'm a really challenging person to work with as a coach is that um, all of the impulses to codify the how inadvertently, unconsciously reinforce within the person 
the fact that they don't have a fucking clue what to do. And rather than going at the consequence of that feeling being unspoken and unworked with, which is what most toxic behavior, most behavior that we define as toxic mm -hmm. on the part of leaders stems from the fact that the person internally is scared that the world is going to find out that they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so they scramble and they run around and they, you know, hurt people. And when we start with the question of how am I organized? What is my belief system? So let me give you a belief system that shows up that's very, very common among powerful people. The world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You better get yours before somebody takes it away from you. Hmm. And we wrap this up in this uh, romanticized notion of competition. Mm -hmm. Scarcity. And we say, we, we, we say to people, we are competitors, right? But what we're really saying is it's a scarcity mindset. And I have to fight for table scraps. I have to be like a dog fighting with another dog for scraps. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just pause for a moment and let's talk about real competition. This just happened a few weeks ago in the Olympics. Two runners, I forget the full story, two runners, right, right they, 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 they came to the finish line and they both asked for gold medals, right? That's not doggy dog. That's interdependence. Mm -hmm. That's true competition because what each of those runners were doing was competing for their personal best. It wasn't about destroying the other person. It was about elevating themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I mean. When, when we have a belief system, which is oftentimes formed in childhood as a defense mechanism, that the world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I have to destroy you before you destroy me. And then we give that person power, and then we scratch our head and we say, why is it such a toxic workplace? Maybe we should teach them how to lead. Let's give them training on giving and receiving feedback. Nonsense. All they're going to do is weaponize that training so that they can destroy the competition. But if we go at why they believe that it's a zero-sum game, that you can't win without me losing and I must win so that you must lose. Mm -hmm. Unless we take that away, nothing's gonna change. That's true. Is there any other um, patterns that come back all the time? I, 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 from my experience, there's like maybe three, four that come back all the time. What, what, what well, a very, very, very common one is conflict avoidance, mm. right? So, so one is taking anxiety and turning it into aggression, right? I have to feel better about myself, so you better work the whole weekend, which is nuts, mm. right? So that's one pattern. But the other pattern is conflict avoidance. Right, not dealing with the reality of what's going on in the organization out of fear. I don't want to create problems. And so then that grows and it grows and it grows. But then there's a whole nother sense, which is because I don't know to whom I belong, I undermine a sense of belonging throughout the entire organization. Mm -hmm. And so no one feels like they're part of the team. Everybody's in competition with one another. And, and then we are surprised when objectives are not met or quarterly estimates are not met or, or turnover is so high. Yeah, people don't feel safe. Um. So many questions for you, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, very, very simple uh, and easy question. Uh, what is life about for you? Uh, we often talk about this at the company. Um, and, and this comes from a line by the poet David White. Um, in one of his prose books, uh, good work done well for the right, right reasons. See, if I can end my day, or more importantly, end my days on this planet, confident in the fact that I have done good work, done it well, and for the right reasons, then I can go gently into the night. Then I can go. So life is about doing good work. And good work means tilting at windmills. It means participating and sparking revolutions. It's a means smuggling in consciousness. It means gently and sometimes not so gently nudging people to grow the heck help. Mm -hmm. Take responsibility for their own life to participate in their own rescue but to not do it with shame. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of uh, sharing your art with the world. Almost like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're almost at the end. Oh, my God. Um, you grew up in New York, and you were there for a big part of your career. Then you moved to uh, Colorado. I'm very mm -hmm. curious, there's something mystical about Colorado. What, what makes people, especially coaches, be there? John Muir, the great naturalist, said, the mountains are calling and I must go. So maybe it's the mountains are calling. Um, there is a connectedness to the land, you know, As I said before, I live, Ali and I live on a farm. I have never been as acutely aware of the weather as I am now. I, I, I know what the moisture feels like. Um, there's a preciseness to the day because I feel the sunrise and the sunset in a completely different way. Mm. So perhaps it's that mm. that's magical about Colorado. Yeah, yeah I should go in there. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, maybe one of the last questions. Um, way too many questions. <laughs> Is there anything else? Of course, there's many things, but um, besides what you've been talking already about, anyone listening to this this uh, conversation, what you would advise? Like, if people say, I'm a leader, okay, I have to slow down, I have to do the work, anything else that you say, that's also really helpful. Yeah, I'm going to read uh, a couple of quick lines from that poem that I referenced before. So you'll bear with me while I find it. <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> This is for, uh, for one who is exhausted. When the rhythm of your heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks. Then all the unattended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. 
weariness invade your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every bone. You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to the small miracles you rush through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Um, if there's one piece of advice I would give people, it's to be excessively gentle with yourself. The world is way too harsh and they don't need it. You do not need the relentless pursuit of perfection anymore. Mm. You can let that go. Very beautiful. I, I actually, uh, while I was in Italy, I had four days, a client with me there. And his main takeaway after four days was, I'm a good person. Hey, well done. I like well it. done. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very important topic, especially for high achievers that they are. Yeah already and i hope he ate gelato every day because mm. <laughs> he deserves it exactly exactly he actually <laughs> <laughs> i recommend him uh, gelateria in the airport when he was <laughs> jerry um Thank you so much for, for your precious time. Uh, it was an absolute um, joy talking to you. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for your conversation. You're welcome. It was a delight to be with you today.